Hello there and uh, welcome to the first in what is hopefully going to be a series of tutorials and web videos by myself. Uh, I thought I'd start off with a really nice tutorial uh, on how to use the Godot game engine. Now Godot is a fairly new game engine, it's something that's only been around for a couple of months now and there's not a great wealth of tutorials available. So what I thought I'd do is I'd run you through making a very simple kind of space shooter style game. Uh, so here's the project, uh, if I just run uh, it so you can see how it works, we press enter to start, we can move the ship around, and we can fire bullets at the incoming asteroids. It's pretty cool, you get more points the more asteroids you shoot, and obviously if one of the asteroids hit you, it's game over. And you press enter to restart, and then we start again. So really a very simple game, not very complex, not a great deal amount of stuff going on, but fun enough to keep you entertained. Um, and a good starting point for our project because it will teach you a couple of the different concepts within Godot. So let's close that for a moment. Um, this is uh, the, the window that has the current game in. You'll notice I have two Godot projects open. That's because what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this one open at all times uh, and just hide it just in case I want to refer back to it later. And I'm going to start in this new window so that we can start completely from scratch. So the first thing you're going to want to do is have a development area set up. Uh, I've kind of short linked mine here, but if you look at the directory, you'll see it's under my Godot uh, folder. I've got all my Godot stuff here, and I've set up Space Shooter 2 as the directory. Um, for this game, we're going to need some art assets, um, and we're not going to make those ourselves. We're going to download them. Kenny is a fantastic uh, website, a fantastic person, I believe, in making these assets. Uh, I assume they're called Kenny. Um, but you can go onto his website, go onto his blog, look for his assets, there's loads of different things. We're going to use the Space Arts assets here, and we're just going to download them. Uh, I've done that already, so I have them here in my download folder. We're just going to unpack and drag those into our Space Shooter folder. Uh, so they're here, ready to use. We don't need any of these main files, so we can delete those, get them out of the way. And there are lots of other files here we're not going to use. I won't delete them for the moment, but uh, safe to say, we don't need them. Now, one of the things that we will need, I've made a couple of modified background files just so that they're the right size, things like that. So I'm going to drag those across as well for me. Um, here we go, we have a background file, which is just the right size for our game, and also a splash file. Uh, for the moment, we'll just drag the background one across into the background folder, BG, there we go. Um, just to speed things up a bit, you can do this yourself. So let's start by making a new project. We're going to choose New Project. We're going to browse. OS X, for some reason, starts in a very weird place, so we're going to have to go through the file system to find exactly where I saved this. Um, where are we? Space Shooter 2, that's it. That's why I want it to call. And we'll call this Space Shooter 2. Wonderful. Project name, Space Shooter 2. You can put spaces in, I'm leaving it all as one, just for consistency's sake. So we're going to create, and now we have Space Shooter 2, here we go. So let's edit. So this is a brand new Godot window. Uh, I'm going to maximise it to make sure that we have the most space possible. Uh, and we're going to switch into 2D mode because this is a 2D game. So now the thing that I find is easiest to do first is to define the size of our game. I'm making this as the correct aspect ratio for iPhones, but also th so that it displays correctly on our screens. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set the width here to 320, and I'm going to set the height. Uh, it's a bit of a weird height, if I remember right. Uh, 568 pixels tall. It's an odd height, it's that height because that's the correct aspect ratio for an iPhone 5, uh, but that's what we're going to do, 568 pixels. Save. OK. Oh, and we should probably change the orientation to portrait. It doesn't really do anything, but useful if we want to later on uh, start doing things. So that's fine. Let's save that and close that. And now we have our game ready to start editing. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say we want a new uh, node, and the node we're going to choose is going to be a 2D node, okay, node 2D, there we go. So we're going to take that, and we're going to add it to the game. We're going to call this game. This is going to be our main game. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add a sprite to it. So I'm going to search for sprite, 
there we go, the sprite, and we're going to add one of those. Now this is going to be our background, so we will just call it BG, very simple. Down here we have the properties for this sprite, so we're going to choose load, art assets, PNG, background, and there's that BG PNG file that I moved over earlier. And great, you can see what it's done is it centered it exactly around the zero origin. Now we don't want it to center around the zero origin because we want it to fill this background area here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off centered here, and that means that instead of being anchored to the center of the image, it'll be anchored to the top left, which means that it should correctly fill our background. Uh, now that we have something working, we can choose the run scene button at the top, play the edited scene. Oh! and we'll see that the scene has never been saved. Before we run, we have to save it. So, we'll go scene, save scene as, and I'm going to save this as main.scn. It doesn't really matter if you what you name it. You can name it scene, xscene, xml, or .res. I think this is one of the issues with Godot, is things tend to be quite inconsistent. You can seem to do lots of different file names. I prefer it if there was just one, um, but that's just how, how Godot works, really. Uh, so we'll save this as main.scene. So now that that's done, we should be able to run the edited scene, and we should get a window with stars in, which is fantastic. That's all we wanted, and it worked. So we can now move on to the next section of the game. So of course, no space shooter is correct or working without a space ship. So let's add a new asset, a new sprite. We've added it here, and let's call this ship. Wonderful. So if we go into our folder of assets, we can have a little look and let's see which one we want. I think that's the one we want, player.png. You'll see that Kenny has provided a number of different files for us. We've got a damage, we've got a left and right tilt. Uh, for this game, it's really simple we're making, so we're going to just use the simple player.png file. So I'm going to go into my textures, load, back up out of the background folder and choose player.png. Fantastic, now we've assigned that. So what we want to do is position our player here, somewhere like that. Now in this game, you'll notice, oh, sorry, whilst I rearrange that, there we go. Uh, the ship never moves along this axis, it only ever moves left and right. So what we want to do is we want to keep it starting completely in the center, but remember it's never ever going to move up and down this way. Uh, so wherever you position it, just kind of make sure that that you're happy with its kind of vertical position. We can set the position here under the transform properties. Uh, I'm going to set it to 160, the X position, because remember our width is 320, so 160 is exactly half that. And for the height, I'm going to set it to, I think, let's try exactly 500, uh, just to keep it a nice round number. If we press enter, there we go, 160 by 500. That's a great position, I think, for the start of where our ship should be. Uh, that's all we need for the moment. Let's get started with doing some actual scripting. So to start scripting, we're going to choose our game node up here, and we're going to choose the script button here. Uh, we can leave all of this as valid. We don't need to add anything at all. We're just going to press create. And now we get our simple starting point. So you'll notice uh, there's a couple of comments. We can get rid of this. And we can get rid of the initialization function as well. So what we're going to do here is we're going to launch our code by starting a ready process. And I'm just going to hook over to my old one to see exactly how we set this up. So what we need to do, ah, that's it, those are the two ones I want. We're going to set it up so that this is the beginning of our code. So ready is what executes immediately as soon as the game starts running. We then set process to true, and then the process function starts to run. And this process is going to run every single frame. So every single frame, this process function is going to run. If you want proof of that, we can simply type in something like print hello world, like that. And then we can hit the run button. And you'll see down here in the console log, hello world is printing out every single frame. Nothing else is happening, of course, but hello world is printing a lot. So we'll just kill that for the moment. So what we're going to do is start by... Um, assigning some keys because it's absolutely no point doing anything unless we can control it with the keyboard. So let's go to scene, 
project settings, and input map. Now the input map is where we can launch any of our keys and assign them to different global variables so that when you push one of these keys, it's going to react. There's a couple of things already predefined. We have UI left and UI right, and that's all we need for the moment. So let's enable those. UI left, UI right. Fantastic. Uh, the only other thing that we might add at this moment in time uh, that isn't currently a trigger for just the space key. So I'm going to add that. So I'm going to choose space, add, and we've got a space option down at the bottom here now. And I'm just going to add a key to it, and I'm going to add the space key by pressing space, clicking OK. And now we have space is assigned to space key, so space is space. Is space. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's kick out of here now. So in our frames, we're going to type if. It's an if statement. That's what we're going to start with. We're going to assign our keys. Now, I'm going to copy this across just so I don't have to remember the syntax. If input action is pressed space, let's start with that. Then someone's pressed the space key. And we can do something fairly simple like uh, let's print out. Oh, sorry. Hello. Again. You'll notice uh, my knowledge of this language is not fantastic. It's very similar to Python, but obviously there's some different bindings. Uh, I've launched the game now, and we'll see that if I press space, oh, nothing happened because I didn't name it properly. Space with a capital S, that should have been. Uh, here we go. And space, there we go. You can see as I press space, it started to add hellos down there. Now, one of the things you'll notice is I only tapped space once, but it printed hello multiple times. That's because this is action pressed, is not whether it's gone down or up, it's whether or not it has gone down and is still down. It, it continues to be down. So what we're going to do is we're just going to fix that because we don't want that to be true for our space key. We want the space to just press it once, and when we press it once, we want it to fire a single bullet. So what we're going to do is we're going to set a new global variable. We'll put it up the top here, and we'll call it something really, really obvious, like is space oops pressed. And we'll set it to false to begin with. Is space pressed false? So what we're going to do, if input action pressed space, if is space pressed equals false, oh, forgot the colon, print hello. And then set is space pressed to true. Now I'm just going to go back and edit this. I like things in camel case and it annoys me. I put a capital letter there. There we go. Is space pressed equals true. Wonderful. Now that is set. So we can come back and we can say else, that's else if it is not pressed, then we can go back and, oh, nope, that's the one I want set it to false, like that. Uh, we just need to see why this is giving me an error. Why? Unexpected assign. Ah! I didn't use double equal sign. There we go. So, that looks a little complex, but in essence it's really quite simple. We start off, if the action is pressed, the space key, if it isn't already pressed, uh, sorry, if it, yeah, if it isn't already pressed, we print hello, and then we set it to true, which means next time this comes around, it's not going to print anything. Uh, and if it's not pressed, if we take our finger up, we'll set it back to false, which means when we press it again, it'll print hello. So if we run that, uh, identify not spelled, have I spelt it wrong? I have, there we go, very sorry about that. again. There we go, come on. Really, run for me this time. There we go. So now I press space once and you'll see it says hello once. Press it again, again, again. And if I hold it down it's not printing continuously, it's just printing it once. So that's great, that'll do uh, for the moment with the space bar. I'm just going to rename this fire so that we know what it's meant to be doing. So 
The next thing we want to do is look at controlling the ship. So we're going to say if action pressed, and then remember this was called UI underscore left, oh, for the left key. And whilst we're here, let's oh, set it up with UI right as well for the right key. So for this, we need to control the position of the ship. So to get the position of the ship, it's really quite simple. What we do is we say var ship position, that's what we're going to call it, is equal to get node ship dot get pos, like that. And that will get the ship's position and put it into the ship pos variable. Okay, so what we can do with that now is we can say if it's going to the left, what we want to do is get the ship position dot x because we want it on the x axis, and we want to say that it's equal to the ship position dot x plus 100 uh, times delta. Now what that's going to do is it's going to mean that when we press left, the ship position is going to increment on the x-axis at uh, a speed which is relative to the frame rate of the computer, which means regardless of the speed of your computer, regardless of the speed the game is playing at, the distance that it will move is always going to be relative to that. So I'm going to set it to 100 uh, to begin with. I think it's going to need to change a little bit. Um, I'm also just for the sake of this, going to very quickly do the opposite here. There we go. So now when we press right, uh, it's going to go the other way. And then finally, once we've done both of those things, we need to actually tell the ship position and set it, because at the moment we've taken it out as a variable, we, now we need to pass it back in. So to do this, we do the opposite. We do get node ship set pause, and we're going to set this to ship pause like that. Now if we run this, get node. My get node function is wrong. What was it meant to be? Get underscore node. Again, my apologies, this is the, uh, the issue with not knowing the language quite as well as I should. Uh, that should now work a lot better. There we go. So now I can move left and I can move right and I can press space and we fire something you can see down in the console. Uh, so that's pretty good. I'm not too happy with the speed, I want to speed it up a bit, so I'm going to set these to 200. And also I got my mappings the wrong way around, so left there was right and right there was left. So to correct that I'm just going to switch this round, oh no actually I'm not, I'm going to make this one minus and this one plus, there we go. Left should come before right I think, uh, just seems, seems correct. So now our ship moves left and right correctly at the right speed and we can press the space bar to fire, which is pretty good, but uh, doesn't particularly do anything very interesting. So let's get rid of this fire command and let's make it something more interesting. So let's actually turn it into a function called fire. To define a new function, it's pretty easy. We just return to the home line, uh, the furthest back, and we can call it func fire, like that. There we go. And now we have a new function called fire. I can put print fire in there just so that we know what's happening. We can see every time it does it on the terminal. Uh, but that's a pretty good place to start. So what we need to do now is assign our laser what we're going to actually fire. Now there are a couple of ways of doing this. I'm going to show you my preferred way of doing it, a way which I think is really useful um, and allows us to really organize things quite well. So let's save this scene and we're going to save a new scene start a new scene, current scene will be lost, it won't because we just saved it, that's fine, okay. So all we're going to do is import one thing into this, one thing only, a single sprite, doesn't need any kind of node, just needs the sprite. And we're going to go and we're going to load our red laser PNG. There we go. So now all this scene has is one red laser sitting exactly on the origin like that. And that's all it's ever going to have. I need to do nothing else with this scene. I'm going to save the scene, and I'm going to save it as oops, laser dot 
XML. But I'm saving it as XML instead of .scn just for my own sanity so that I can kind of tell the difference between a scene and what I'm going to think of as an asset. I suppose I could use the .res but I'm going to use .xml uh, just for the sake of doing it. So that's fine. So let's choose save. That's great. Now let's go back and open up our main .scene and head back into our script panel. So to get a laser, we need to load the laser into the scene, and we can do that at the top. I'm going to bring this section in up here. So I'm going to put it right at the top because it's something we're loading. And in my previous version, I was calling it bullet. I don't want to do that. I want to call it laser this time around. So we should see if we've named that correctly, the error disappears. There we go, because it's correctly loaded it. Um, but we're saying from our resources folder load laser.xml and I want to lo load that as the variable laser. That's great. So now we have a couple of variables up here. It's going to start getting a bit messy, but uh, bear with me. There we go. So in our function of fire, what we want to do is add this laser to the screen. So again, if we just take it from our code snippets, we can see at the bottom, here we go. I'm going to rename these as I go as well, because I'm unhappy with how I named it before. I want to call this a laser instance. And what that does is it means that now this laser instance is an instance of that laser that we loaded in earlier. So we've essentially created a new laser. Again, we haven't put it on the actual screen yet. We've just loaded it in. Um, and the next thing I'm going to do is take my laser instance and I'm going to set the name to laser and then a string of laser count because I want each laser to be individually named so I'm going to increment laser count each time. I'm going to do that by declaring here that I want laser count to equal laser count plus one and that means every time this runs laser count will be incremented. We haven't actually set laser count yet, so let's set it up here, straight underneath the laser, because they're kind of related. So laser count equals zero. There we go. So now we have a laser and a laser counter. This means that now laser instance set name, we've given it a name, which means it's something we can refer to once we put it in. And then we can simply run that, add child laser instance. Okay, so we've said add child laser instance. So at the moment, if we run that as it is, what we should find is that we can move left, we can move right, and when we press space, you can see that it has added a laser, but it's added it right up there, right at the very top, because that's where it was positioned uh, in its own XML file. So it's positioned right up there. But that's good. The laser is there for the moment, and that's all we really needed to see. So what we're going to do now is very similar to what we did before with this spaceship. We're going to get the position of the laser. Um, so we're going to say laser position is equal to the ID. Now the reason we specified this ID earlier is so that we can call it here. It's kind of important, I think, uh, to give it a name because uh, it means we can later address it. You don't have to give it a name, but it does make manipulating afterwards a little bit more tricky. So we're going to get the node and we're going to get its position. And what we're going to do is we are going to set its position um, to where we want it to initially fire from. Okay, so again, let's just take this string, put it in there. There we go. Set pause to laser pause because that's what we're going to call it. And we want the laser pause dot y to be equal to 500 because that's the position of the ship um, and we want the laser pause dot x to be equal to ah, you see and this is where we need to get the ship position again there we go because we want it to be equal to the ship pause dot x that way as the ship moves around the laser position that we fire in is also going to move around so what we're going to do is just run that and check that that did what we think it's going to do. So if I move the ship around, move the ship right to the left, press space, and you'll see that a laser has been created there. Press space again, another laser, space, another laser, space, another laser, space, another laser. So that's good. We have our position to these lasers starting, and we can add multiple lasers to the scene. 
Now the last thing I want to do is be able to keep track of all these lasers. And the way I really like to do this is with an array. So I'm just going to say var laser array, like that. And we're going to set it to an empty array, because there's nothing in it to begin with. And then at the end of this, what we're going to do is we're going to say laser array dot push, oops, underscore back, and we're going to put in this string, like that, okay? And what that means is that we're going to add to that array the string of the name of this laser, okay? And then what I'm going to do, just for the sake of it, is we're going to print out laser array, like that, just to debug. So we can run the game, we can see we move forward, press space, and you can see laser 1 is there. Press space again, you see laser 1, laser 2. Again, laser 1, laser 2, laser 3, and that's the array. And we keep going, and we keep adding more lasers uh, to this array. And we do it lots, and you can see we can add hundreds of lasers to this array of lasers, if we would like to do so. So, now what we need to do is make these lasers actually do something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in my process, this is what's running all the time, I'm going to start a new section of it down here. Uh, we can start this by maybe commenting it um, if we want to, but I'm not going to bother because I can keep track of it in my head. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a for loop. So we're going to say for the laser in laser array, so for every laser in laser array, what we want to do is get the node, oh, that's completely the wrong line of text, sorry, we want to do this one. So, we're going to say laser pause again, get node for laser, because we stored it as a string and array, this comes straight out as a string and we can access immediately that laser that we put in, and we want to get the position of it, okay? And then what we want to do is update that position, so laser, whoa, laserpos.y, we want to equal laserpos.y uh, minus, because we're moving upwards, minus about maybe 200, let's say, times delta, like that. So that's all we're going to do there. Really, really simple. And now, if we press space, oh, nothing happened. Intriguing. I wonder why. Let's have a look. Let's go back. Laser pause, laser pause, y equals... Ah, because we didn't ever set the position out again. Of course, we set the laser y, but we didn't actually set that back into the position of that laser. So we're going to go here, add laser, set pause to laser pause, like that. Now, if we run, when we fire, we should see that the lasers start to move away from the ship as fast as we can fire them, which is kind of cool. But we have a huge, huge array now of lasers, many of which have disappeared off the screen, and that's not too useful for us uh, in the grand scheme of things. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a kind of condition here. We're going to say if the laser pause y is less than zero, so if it's gone off the edge of the screen, then we want to delete it, and I'm just going to copy this across uh, so that I can remember exactly what it is. There we go. Uh, that's the one. Remove and delete child git node laser. So what that will do is remove and delete it. You, there are some options for just remove, and what that does is removes it from the viewpoint, but doesn't actually delete the data instance. We want to delete it completely. We have no interest in this laser anymore, so we use a remove and delete child. Get node laser. And the next thing we want to do is remove it from the array. Okay? So what we can do here is we can say laser array dot remove. And then we have to put in the ID of the laser that we want to delete. Now, we're iterating through here, but we're not iterating through by ID number. We're iterating through by the name of each one. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set up a simple counter. So we're going to have laser ID here. I'm going to set it to zero to start with. And then at the end, what we're going to do of this for loop, uh, sorry, is laser 
ID equals laser ID plus one. Because the first laser ID is zero in the array, so we have to go through it once, uh, just in case that first one is disappearing before we can add one to the end of it. And then here we can remove laser ID. So if we run this again, what you should see is we can fire, a laser comes up, fire, 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 and if we just remove those, there we go, they should have disappeared now. So if I press space again, you'll see there's only one laser in that array, laser six. Do it twice, we get kind of four, um, and then once they've disappeared, if we fire again, we can see that the array has dropped back down to one or two, uh, depending on how many lasers we have on screen at any one time. So that's great. Now we have our lasers moving forward in space. Okay, so now that we've got that working, we can move on to the next step, which is to get the rocks to come towards us. So I'm going to start by just uh, copying and pasting. You'll see I love copying and pasting. I'm going to take the fire function, which we've already written, and I'm going to duplicate it in its entirety and call it new rock, like that. Okay, and we're going to go through and we are going to change everything so that it's late rock instead of laser. So we're going to say rock count uh, up there and of course we need to make a new rock count. We're going to import uh, the rock XML file which we haven't ooh, which we haven't made yet uh, but we will in just a second and we're going to make a rock array. There we go. So now we have a rock preloading the rock.xml. It'll give me an error because this file doesn't currently exist. A rock count and a rock array. So new rock, rock count. We'll get it to print rock every time a new rock is created. And we're just going to go through and periodically rename this so that it's correct. Rock instance equals rock instance. And then we rock instance here. Uh, this is not rock laser count, it's rock count, should be that the whole way through. Uh, rock instance, any other things, we're going to call it rock pause. Uh, we don't need to know the ship position for this specifically, so I can get rid of those for the moment. And just obviously change the naming convention to rock 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 array rock array okay so that should be everything set up the way we want it now when a rock appears we don't want it to position itself at y500 where the ship is we want them to come from the top so we're going to set this to minus 5 just so they appear a little bit off the screen on the y axis now that X position, what we want, of course, is for the rocks to appear randomly from the top. And luckily, there is a lovely function built into GoDot to allow you to do that. It is, I believe, just as simple as putting random range. There we go. So, we want it to go between 0 and 320 pixels, um, because that's the width of our screen. So the rocks can appear anywhere along that axis, like that. So that's really very simple. We have a new rock function, which will generate a new rock for us. Now, of course, we need to go and make this rocks.xml. So let's, uh, where are we? Save our scene. We're going to say a new scene. Yes, we want to start a new scene. We're going to go to our 2D. We're going to start. We're going to get a sprite, as we did before. Uh, always intrigues me as to why that sometimes doesn't do what you think it's going to do. Hmm. Scene. There we go. We are in resources. Sprite. These tabs sometimes kind of hard to tell where you are. Uh, and we're going to call this rock. And we're going to load meteor small. There we go. Done. That's all we need to do. Save scene, save it as, I'm going to save it as rock.xml, save, and then we can load back to our main scene. And now you'll see this error has gone away because a rock.xml actually does exist. So what we need now is for this to exist. Uh, and so we want the rocks to appear on a fairly regular basis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a new variable, and I'm going to call it time since last rock. 
and we're going to set it to zero. So let's come down to the bottom of our frame rate process, and we're going to say if time since last rock is greater than 0 0.9, oh, let's say 1, for every 1 second, okay, then we want a new rock, okay, so all we need to do is make sure that this is also incrementing, uh, so we'll come back, we'll say time since the last rock equals time since last rock plus delta, that way the time gets added into this variable, if it gets to more than 1 second we create a new rock, and we set the time since we've had a last rock back to zero. That should mean that every second we get a new rock generated from the top. Let's have a look and see what happens. Oh, time since last rock identifier not found. Why not? Let's have a look. Plus delta. Uh, that should be fine. I don't see the issue there. Identify and not found time since last rock. Ah, uh, totally my own fault. Missed out the capital letter on there. There we go. Ah, uh, and another bug at the bottom. Uh, the position here. Yeah, we want to save it to rock pause. Hopefully you caught that before I did. Uh, sorry about that. It's just what happens. Uh, when you're trying to do this all off the top of your head. Great. So now we can see that rocks have started to appear along the top here. Uh, they're not moving down yet, but they are randomly appearing at the top every one second, which is great. That's exactly what we want. So now we need to do exactly the same kind of thing that we did with the lasers. What we want them to do is all move down. So I'm going to leave this rock generator at the bottom of my script and I'm going to go and take and copy the laser moving that we did before. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this rock ID for each rock in rock array. Then we want rock pos to equal the rock. We're going to take the rock pos. Oops. And instead of moving down, we want it to move up. Uh, let's say we probably want them to move a little bit faster than the speed of the lasers uh, to make life a little bit harder for us. Uh, and then we're going to set this back like that. And of course here we want the opposite thing to happen. We want if the rock position gets to a greater position than I think it was about 5, 6, 3, I think was what we set our height of our game to. Let's just see, we can see under project settings pretty easily. 5, 6, 8, I do apologise. Um, 5, 6, 8, if it's greater than 5, 6, 8, then we can remove the rock and remove from the array the rock ID. And we're just going to increment our rock ID like that. And of course, before we run this, we just need to change the laser array as well. Um, I just tried doing that and it crashed, so apologies if the recording uh, cut out. But there we go, rock array dot remove rock ID, rock ID equals rock, rock, rock. So now we should be able to run this. And we should see this moves down pretty easily. Rocks fall towards us. We can move around and we can fire lasers at rocks. Nothing happens yet. Nothing matters if anything hits anything, but we have the gameplay mechanics working. We have our lasers moving in a straight line upwards, and we have our rocks coming down at us as we move. So that's a fairly successful beginning uh, to this. So the next thing we need to do is work out if there are any collisions between the rocks and the lasers. Now we could tag on to these for loops uh, already. I'm not going to do that simply because I would rather split it into separate functions because it makes it easier for the center tutorial. It's not going to be as quick splitting it because you're essentially doing multiple things multiple times, but I think it's better for the tutorial if I start splitting things up a little bit to make it easier. So what we're going to do is, those are our kind of movement functions, and now we'll do our collision function. So again, we're going to iterate through our laser um, we're going, to, we're going to iterate through our different laser things here. 
So for each laser, in laser. Then we need to do, for each rock, in rock, with a rock ID as well. Like that. Okay? Um, and the reason that we're going to do that is so that we can iterate through each laser and then through each rock because obviously we have to check for each laser that it has not hit any of those rocks. So we can now say if oh no we can't do that yet because we need to get the rock pos and we also need to get the laser pos like that. Okay so now we have the position of the rock and the laser. Now we can say that if the rock, hmm, let me think about this a little bit before I begin to type. If the laser position dot y is less than the rock position dot y, so now we're filtering it so that it's only rocks that are um, next to, or, or lasers that are behind our rock position. That's great. So that filters down the number of things. Okay. So we then say if the laser pos, oops, laser pos dot x is greater than the ros pos, ros pos, rock pos dot x minus ten. So this means if the laser is within uh, the left hand side of that rock. I'm guessing that the rocks are going to be about 25 pixels wide, uh, maybe 30 pixels. So let's set it to 15 either side of that rock. So if the laser position, we're going to treat as a kind of single static point uh, for the sense of this gameplay. If the laser position, x, is greater than the left hand side, that's what I mean by this, the left hand side of that rock pos, it means it could possibly hit it, and then again we filter down even more, so we say if it is smaller than the rock pos plus 15, so that means that any lasers, the only lasers now that are going to be referenced here are lasers that are behind our rock and in line with our rock, okay? If that happens, then what we want to do is we want to go through and we want to remove oops, the rock, remove the rock array, and we want to do the same thing for the laser, because we want both the rock and the laser to disappear upon collision. So that should work great. Um, so now all we need to do is make sure that we have our rock ID equals rock ID plus one there, and we have our laser ID equals laser ID plus one there. Now if we run this, <laughs> hopefully, oh, what did I miss? Laser! I missed an R. I missed an R. Terrible. Terrible. There we go. That should run now. So now if our lasers hit the rocks, the rocks ooh, should disappear. I think our lasers are going a bit slow really. Um, it doesn't make for a very exciting game, so I'm just going to speed the lasers up. Once you have everything moving like this, you can begin to tell what's right. I'm going to double the speed of the laser. There we go. And that should make the game more exciting. Let's run. Let's see. Pow. 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 Very, very cool. So. Obviously, none of this is any use without a score to keep track of things, so we're going to go back to our main game, and we're going to add something, and we're going to add a text area. Uh, nope, it's not called text, it's called lay... Ah, fingers. It's called label. So there we are, we're going to add a label. And I'm going to drag this, make this full width, stick it there, align text to the centre, so now whatever text is there will be in the centre. Um, and we're just going to call this score. We're going to come into our scene and I'm going to set up a score variable. It's going to equal zero. At the beginning of the game we want it to actually say zero, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put 
uh, set. No, no, what am I doing? Var. No, 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 no. Get node score. Oh, lowercase. Get node score. Set text to score like that. Now you would think that would work, it won't work because we haven't defined it as a string. So you must cast things to a string in Godot if you want it to uh, convert. It doesn't do any automatic conversion or type conversion at all. Uh, so get no score, set text sort, that should set everything correctly as we want it. Uh, and once we've done this here, we want to do the same. We want score to equal score plus one and then we want to set it so that the score increments. You might be wondering why I keep doing things like score equals score plus one instead of something like score plus plus, which programmers should be used to. That's because this does not exist in Godot. It doesn't work properly. You must define it in this way. I don't like that. I would much rather do score plus plus. It would make life easier, but that's just how things are. So that's really as easy as it is to add a score to our system. You'll see now as I shoot the rocks, you'll see every rock that I successfully kill increments to our score. Of course nothing happens if the rocks are hitting us yet, which is a bit of a shame, um, but at least we're along the right track. So the next thing I'm going to do is show you how to make that text a little bit nicer, because I wasn't really a fan of it there. It was a bit boring, a bit small, not interested. So we're going to choose import font, and we're going to choose a font. Now I haven't got a font ready, uh, I have got one downloaded though because we downloaded it earlier, remember? Oh no we didn't, I haven't shown you that yet. So the font I'm using is called Cubano, it's a great font, uh, Cubano. It's nice, uh, clean, classy, fresh and sexy as the creator says. You can get it from the Lost Type Cooperative. Um, you can buy it for free, if you like the font I recommend you buy it, donate, it's great. Um, really good font. Now the font is free for personal use, not commercial use, and I can't release it with the game asset, so you will have to download this yourself. I can't just uh, give it back like I could with the candy ones. But we'll download it, and inside the folder you should see there's an OTF file. So what we're going to do is we're going to drag this into our Space Arts Assets folder that we have, and then in here we should see Cubano Regular. That's what we want. We're going to open it, and you can see it's loaded it. Now fonts in Godot have a particular set size, uh, you can't adjust the size once you've imported it, so you have to kind of think about this before we do it. Uh, I'm going to set mine to a size of about 45 for the score. I want a big chunky number at the top. Uh, maybe 43, a little bit smaller. There we go. But I want a big chunky number. It's not really going to be showing anything other than this font. And then we have to set a name for it. So I'm going to call this Cubano Score. That's it. That's great. And we'll save it in the asset folder as well. Fantastic. Import. Could not save. Ah, didn't add the file extension. Again, Godot doesn't do anything like that automatically, you must remember. Add .ftn, press import, done. Now, on our score, we can change the properties. Uh, we don't want to change the text, we want to change the font, which should be down here, custom fonts. Font, load, back up, there it is, Cubano score, font, open. Great. Uh, and obviously you can't see anything here because nothing's set yet. If we wanted to, we could just type score like that. And then you can see where it's going to appear. Obviously, as soon as we've launched the game, we have decided that we want to set this back to zero. So you, you'll never see it say score, uh, but it's just for kind of reference of things here. So we can play. And there we go. We have a nice big chunky number, which does some proper counting up. I think that's a lot more fun than what we had before. Perfect. Great. So the last and final thing that I'm going to show you today in the tutorial is how to make it so that our ship dies if the rock hits it. So what we're going to do is another one of these iteration things. Again, I repeat, this is not the cleanest way of doing it, but it just shows it nicely for the tutorial. So var rock ID, we're going to reset to zero, and then we're going to loop through our rock array again. We are going to get the rock position again. Again, I say this is not a clean way of doing it. It's not resource unintensive, but it's just the quickest way and easiest way to show you. Um, and we are also going to do something which we haven't done for a while, which is get the ship position by getting the ship. There we go. Okay, now 
we can say if our rock pos y is greater than 500, because that's the position of where the ship is. So this is only now talking about the rocks that are at, at, at that level. We can say if the rock pos dot x and again we need to define the kind of the limits of this so we're going to say if the left hand side of that rock position the left hand side of that rock position is less than the right hand side of the ship so we're going to say ship position dot x plus i think it's probably quite wide the ship so i'll set it to 30 something like that uh, uh, maybe 25, it's probably only about 50 pixels wide. Okay, and uh, another if, if the rock position plus 15, so the right hand side of the rock is greater than the left hand side of the ship, then we have a definite collision. So what we're going to do is we are going to, for the moment, oops, capital letters, print Crash, like that. Okay, um, and I'm just going to get rid of these prints down here for the rock array, just so it makes it a little bit easier for us to tell what's happening. Uh, let's get rid of the, that rock and that fire as well. There we go. So now the only print should be this crash thing. So if the rock comes down, nothing's happening. Crash, nothing there, nothing there nothing there. It's possible that the measurements are slightly off, so let's just measure. This is, it's actually 90 pixels wide, 100 pixels wide. So I got my estimates very off there with how wide the ship was. That's why we were seeing kind of an, an odd thing there at the beginning where it didn't quite do what we want. So I'm going to increase this uh, quite a lot, the ship position. I'm going to set it to 40. I want to have a little bit of clipping room on the end. Uh, I want to be nice to my players. So if the, if the wings just clip, I'm going to let it slide. Uh, so we'll set it to 40 each, and that should nicely uh, sort that one out. So if that happens, we want to do a couple of things. We want to set the text in the score box so it no longer displays the score, but instead displays crash, like that. Okay, And we want to stop the game. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a game running variable to false. And within my process delta, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to migrate this stuff out. So I'm actually going to put this in a new function called game. Uh, delta, um, and then within the process what I'm going to say is if game running is equal to true, then we can run this game delta. Game running doesn't exist yet, so we're going to have to set it up here, game running equals true to begin with, because we want the game to start by being true, that's got to be, or that should be a double equal sign because it's a question, not a definition. Uh, if game running true, there we go. Oh, missing a code on there. There we go. Um, and we should be able to, let's just check that I set that correctly, there we go. So, if we run this game, what should happen now is we can still do everything that we used to do, but as soon as one of those rock hits us, the game freezes, like that. Game freezes, nothing happens at all. So, last and not least, what we want to do is to be able to reset everything from scratch. So what I'm going to do is we're going to say, if the game is not running, if the input is pressed UI accept, uh, and we just need to check that we have that enabled. Uh, input map UI accept, and we're just going to remove space because we defined space for something else. There we go. So if we press return or enter or a different button on your PlayStation, Xbox, etc., etc., if you press the enter button essentially uh, on this code, we want to restart the game. So we're going to say 
restart like that. Now that's not a built-in function, we're going to have to program it, uh, but that shouldn't be too hard to do. So we're going to go right to the bottom. Here we go. And we are going to write function restart. Oh, not fun restart. Function restart. So what we're going to do is we are going to go for rock in rock array var rock rock id equals zero again we should be very familiar with this we're looping through all of the rocks because so what we need to do is remove all of the rocks and we have uh, we have that here already so let's just go and do that there we go uh, we have that set up like that remove and delete child ah, actually we don't even need to do this this time because what we can do is we can use the rock array clear command once we've done that so we can say remove there we go syntax is wrong rock id equals zero for rock and rock we can get rid of that remove and delete child get node rock rock array clear and that just empties out all of them at once makes life just slightly easier to read laser array remove and delete child laser so that clears the rocks and the lasers off the screen and clears the arrays as well it empties it the last thing we need to do is reset the ship position um, so there should be something that we can copy around there we go our ship pause we can put that down here so we get the ship pause uh, to begin with we're going to say what we want is we want the ship pause dot y hasn't changed it's just the dot x we want it to equal 160 which is what is equal when we started and then we're just going to go and set it so there we go set pause to ship pause last but no means least we need to reset the score counter to zero um, and we do that by simply saying score equals zero and then by typing in that we want it to set to that beginning pace. And finally, of course, we want to set game running to true. And that should reset everything for us. So let's press start. We can move around. We can shoot rocks. There we go. And if the rock hits us, game pauses, press enter everything restarts from the beginning again. Great, well there are a couple of different things that we could add, many tweaks we could do. Uh, one of my personal favourites is getting the rocks to rotate a little bit, uh, but I might do that in a separate video or I might tag it on the end now just to show you how the rocks rotate. But that's really it, I'm not going to show you how to do any of the menu stuff, I think you can figure that out for yourself, uh, but this is a good enough uh, example of how we can create a pretty simple game pretty quickly. Okay, it might not be the most high-tech in the world, but it works, and you know what, it's quite fun to play. Uh, I've been Callum Not. hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe, and uh, if you want to head over to my website, uh, it is ad-supported. I'd love it if you turned off Adblock and perhaps clicked on one of the adverts there, uh, if they interest you, of course, um, just because it helps me with my funds. I'm a student, and it's, uh, yeah, it would be great. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice day.